Welcome to the Conversations on International Development. Um, today, our guest is um, Jonathan Crush. Jonathan is a university research professor at Wilfrid Laurier University. He founded the South African Migration Program, a consortium of Canadian and African researchers, and co-founded the African Food Security mm -hmm. Urban Network a research policy and capacity building network of Canadian and African universities, NGOs, and municipal governance networks. Jonathan's book, mm -hmm. Power of Development, is on your reading list, which though not listed in his latest work because it's 1995, uh, is a classic uh, and does form parts, uh, part of debates about modernity, modernization, and post-development, which we will be, of course, uh, covering in this term. So, I, Jonathan, if I may, I will start with some questions on the on this aspect of your work before moving on to your latest work on food and hunger, which is also, of course, of um, great interest to us. So, yes. So your work on post-development built a sharp critique of the ideas of development and how it is expressed, the power of discourse, narratives, vocabularies, and texts of development, and also showed us how this underpins its, that is the development um, architecture. So what I wanted to ask you was how and why did you come to uh, focus on this issue and how did you come to take this position and looking back to 1995 when the book came out, has your position changed at all in, in the context of globalization, context of where neoliberalism and where we find ourselves today? Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, hello to everybody. Pleased to uh, talk to you about, uh, about my work. Um, start with your first question about you know, how and why I came to uh, to do this particular volume. Um, there's really two ways to answer the question. Uh, one is more personal, perhaps autobiographical, uh, and one is more uh, contextual. Start perhaps with the personal, autobiographical. Um, in, um, I think it's a, you know, one's experiences in, in earlier life are quite important. And I actually grew up in uh, Africa. I spent my teen years uh, right up to A levels in uh, Swaziland. Um, and I was kind of, you know, as a young person, sort of aware that I've been surrounded by uh, development, uh, development talk and development experts. and people, uh, usually the parents and my friends, uh, from development agencies and, and various projects. So development you know, was everywhere. Um, it's a language that framed much of what uh, Swaziland's own post-1968 independence project was all about. Um, and even my own father actually who was an educator, saw himself really as an agent uh, of development. And then later in uh, Lesotho, where I had my first academic job at university, um, the, the capital Miseru, where I was living, was really crawling with a whole new breed of mainly American and Irish uh, development experts with uh, the development projects and programs funded by the governments. Um, some of you may be aware of, of uh, um, James Ferguson's book, Anti-Politics Machine, which was really a brilliant expose of the aims and really abject failures of one such development project in the Sutu, which was actually funded by the Canadians. Um, when I started my PhD research on colonial land and labor policy in Swaziland, it became clear to me that even back in the 19, or the 1890s, first British officials in the country saw their mission um, very much as bringing developments to a kind of disorderly and chaotic local population. Um, so colonial officials in Swaziland were 
using this 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 language uh, of development way 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 back. So that's really the first sort of um, autobiographical aspect. It's my own kind of attempts to try and make sense of, of what I was hearing and seeing uh, around me. It's positive. But I mean, secondly, a little more personal, I mean, more as a hobby than anything else. I was always a fan of fiction. I uh, actually almost did English uh, literature as a subject as an undergraduate. I had a choice between doing English or geography at uh, the Cambridge College I went to. Uh, and they weren't offering English tutoring at the time, so I, I, I chose geography and went off in that direction. Um, but I continued to read a lot of fiction, and I started reading literary criticism in the 1980s, in particular, um, this new form of, of critique or discourse analysis, which is really treating, uh, um, this has been taken up by a lot of social scientists, uh, and they're treating um, non-fiction, really, as a form of fiction, you know, with its own narrative and plots and stylistic techniques and imagery. I started to think I could apply this kind of uh, approach to uh, non-fiction texts that I was familiar with. Um, actually, first, before, look, before thinking about development, I, I first uh, looked at a whole series of travelogues uh, that were being written about South Africa at the time by people who were visiting it. Uh, and it was very clear how um, these travelogues really reproduced the form of storytelling that was very familiar. Uh, and taken back to European explorers of Africa in the 19th century. I also thought it would be interesting to see if the writings by so-called sort of progressive and radical geographers of the time could be seen as a form of literary text. Now, published in about 1992, uh, an article called The Discourse of Progressive Human Geography. Um, it was only an attempt to at, at that. I'd lost me a couple of friends who saw it as a personal attack on the objectivity work. Um, but it, it just increasingly occurred to me, and in fact many, many, I suppose, of the other contributors to the book have come to this conclusion that, that development texts uh, were I mean, not the most exciting uh, texts, to be sure, uh, but they could also be treated as a type of fiction uh, amenable to literary analysis. So that's really what I set out to do. Um, and to draw in other people who were thinking similarly um, and then looking at the idea of development as a fiction. Um, so that's kind of on the personal side. Uh, on, 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 in terms of context, um, I think this perhaps would be more relevant to uh, you know, a course like yours. Um, I was you know, aware through the 1980s of um, the, um, theories of let's call them theories of development um, through uh, some of my colleagues and mentors, particularly at Queen's University in Canada, where I was, where I had my first post. Um, and, um, and it's becoming evident, I think, to them and therefore to me, that development is an idea and practice was in deep trouble. Mm. Academics were having a great deal of difficulty finding it. Um, there were a number of development dictionaries published at the time and multiplying definitions, which were actually pretty confusing to anything like myself trying to develop courses uh, on the subject. And I had a colleague at Queen's, uh, Bob Shenton, who is quite influential because he was working on a book that was eventually published actually after Power doctrines of development. Um, and his argument is, is basically argument is prefigured in actually a short uh, chapter in uh, Power of Development. Um, and what he was doing was, was essentially saying that uh, although most courses and textbooks looking at the history of development were kind of saying that 1945 was pivotal and, and that's as far back as you needed to go, um, he was arguing that the, the whole idea of development could be traced back much, much further. In fact, and, and he, he and a colleague did so. 
in terms of trying to set it in the context of disruption of the Industrial Revolution um, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, so development wasn't new, it wasn't new. Um, it uh, emerged as a set of ideas that promoted and licensed interventions by various agencies, including governments, um, to deal with social and economic uh, disorder. Which is really why I started our development uh, with quotes from a speech that was given in London in 1895, which captures uh, how development has supposedly transformed this kind of disorderly, chaotic, uh, and dangerous uh, Malawian landscape. Um, and this really just to affirm that uh, Shenton's argument that ideas about development are not a post-1945 invention, but the central to colonialism and imperialism, uh, colonial thought. So that was one aspect, in other words, giving development a history. But second, um, most courses then and still do uh, take students on a kind of whirlwind Cook's tour, uh, Cook's could exist anyway, uh, Cook's tour of theories of development. Um, and uh, my colleague then, Colin Lees, was working on a book uh, which surveyed the field of development theory up until the early 1990s, and eventually published as, as you know, a provocative title, The Rise of Four of Development Theory. Um, in essence, I suppose he was arguing that development theory was a pretty much uh, a dead end. Um, and personally, I thought there must be new ways of looking at it. Not, not really to develop a new theory about development, but rather to look uh, at how development itself was actually thought about or talked about uh, by those who claimed to be doing it. Um, and then finally, so it's a long answer, but finally, uh, in terms of context, um, you know, and this is clear, I think, from the book, I mean, um, it relates to the situation, the transformation in South Africa, because um, the apartheid state in South Africa had couched its racist policies of separate development very much in uh, the language of international development. And I thought that, you know, as apartheid collapsed and was replaced by the radical ideas of the uh, African National Congress, the ANC, um, that these ideas about development would also die uh, with, with, uh, with apartheid and apartheid ideology. Um, but instead, I mean, by the early 1990s, it became increasingly obvious that the ANC was reframing its policies and agendas uh, in terms of the language of development. And really, this has continued right through uh, to the present. So that's really uh, how I got to, uh, to put in this collection uh, together. Great. Well, I mean, that is fantastic because I do think increasingly that uh, sort of knowing something about our own histories through the lens of our academic uh, perusal then allows us to sort of, you know, also understand why some people are attracted towards certain arguments, uh, certain frameworks, certain visions. And in your book also, I mean, I think the first chapter is about sort of, you know, um, uh, imaginaries of development. So having heard you sort of talk about your personal and the political, very feminist uh, approach to development then makes me understand you better. So thank you so much for that. But I also would like to know a little bit more about uh, the second part of the question, which uh, is do you think, I mean, like Colin Lee's book of sort of, you know, development theory as dead end, and you said that you were sort of thinking maybe if we could only understand, use different lenses, you might, we might be able to understand development better. Um, do you think that um, look, sort of using discourse and using sort of, you know, different lenses uh, could allow us to think through development theory differently? Um, 
And could there be more uh, of an imaginary of an inclusive development uh, as a result of that? Or do you think that's just an oxymoron? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> yeah, let me frame my answer in terms of uh, the way in which I recall you, 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 you first asked this question, which was really, I mean, for me to reflect uh, on whether and how my positions changed. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking 20, 25 years uh, later. And I have to say, I have been approached by publishers more than once to do a second edition. All right. Uh, and so I've, I've given some thought, although I mean, ideas kind of half baked about what that might look like. And I, and I haven't really reached the point where I can say, yes, I think I know what it should look like and, um, and let's go ahead with it. So that's still a, 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 pending, uh, a pending thing because obviously I wouldn't want to um, simply, as you know, some do, have the second edition, which was identical to the first edition. Right? So one would have to to really think about first the ways in which the world has or hasn't changed in that period, but then secondly, and I think more um, importantly, is that kind of approach uh, still uh, useful and valid? Which I think is the question. Uh, you're, you're, you're asking. Um, I had uh, occasion to think about this question a couple of years ago um, when I was invited to actually answer pretty well the same question by the editors of uh, Progress in Human Geography. And to my surprise, they designated this book as a classic in human geography. But anyway, um, <clears throat> their procedure for their classics is to get commentaries on the influence uh, of, of a book um, and then to invite a response from uh, the person responsible, in this case myself. Uh, so, uh, so Progress in Human Geography in 2016 actually then published uh, two commentaries, uh, one by Gillian Hart uh, of California, Berkeley, and one by Uma Katari of Manchester. Um, and they were really the, the first to, to tell me that um, the, the book Power Development was seen as being kind of representative of a broader kind of school of thought or analysis that had been called uh, post-development. Um, and they both really pointed out uh, how much the world had changed since the early 1990s. Um, but Hart in particular uh, concluded um, a commentary by saying, uh, let me just find a quote uh, from her. Um, okay. Yeah, she said, um, development is alive and flourishing, holding out promises of restoring order to an increasingly dangerous world. So in responding to this question of, of ongoing uh, relevance, prompted me to actually reflect on what I had myself been uh, doing as an academic researcher in those post-1995 years, leading up to my appointment uh, at the Bolsillie School in Waterloo, uh, uh, with a research chair in something called Global Migration and Development. Um, and to reflect on really two decades of research, I've been involved in on international migration and then more recently it's linked with, uh, with food security. Um, I can just say something about the, the migration issue first because it's quite important I think to, to, this, to this question. Um, if you go back to the 1990s, uh, most government states were uh, at complete odds on each other's throats about migration. Uh, and its uh, negative impacts. There was really no consensus and, and efforts by the UN to get dialogues and debates going on, on migration was completely unsuccessful. And migration actually is not even mentioned in the Millennium uh, Development Goals, which is kind of a reflection of, of, of how sticky a subject it was. 
was uh, for states to talk about. And then something remarkable happened in, uh, after the turn uh, of the century. Uh, and that was that migration was, was kind of reinvented as a development issue. Um, and the positive benefits of migration began to be stressed by the United Nations uh, the agencies and also the IOM, International Organization for Migration. And, and there was talk of something called a triple win, um, where migration would have positive development benefits for countries of origin, countries of destination, and for migrants themselves. Um, and this, this sort of change, this, this, this um, bringing migration into the language of development and vice versa um, led to new institutions, such as the Global Forum for Migration Development, uh, new forms of cooperation between states. Uh, talk to him very common in the 1990s about the brain drain was replaced really with the talk about diasporas and diaspora engagement. And it was clear that also that, that new ideas, these new ideas of development, uh, it was really an old idea, uh, mm. really mentioned, um, was the antidote to chaos and disorder in migrant sending areas. This became known as a sort of root causes uh, doctrine, which was suggesting that um, the, the outflow of migrants, uh, particularly from, say, African countries to Europe, could be countered by European states uh, through the agency of development in those source areas. Um, and it seemed to me that, 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 that this language of migration development was, was perfectly amenable to the kinds of analysis that you see in, uh, in, in power development. Um, so sort of consistent with long-standing ideas about the power of development to manage and mitigate disorder. Um, and in, I mean, in the book itself, I, I've made the point that I didn't think that the, these ideas that stretch back to the Industrial Revolution were going to disappear uh, very quickly. Uh, and I could see them resurfacing uh, in this work. Um, so, I mean, the answer is really that, that um, yes, I think treating uh, development of its text and imagery as a literary text, amenable to textual analysis, does seem to need to still be uh, relevant. Um, and I suppose it, it, it keeps the question alive of. Mm -hmm. Firstly, um, what forms of practical intervention uh, these particular texts advocate, uh, legitimize, and more, and perhaps as important, silence. Um, that's always part of what, what's going on with development texts. Uh, is, is, is silencing as well. Um, and I suppose the fundamental question which you pose is, you know, is do we really need this? Uh, language at all. Um, and I would have to say, I, I'm kind of still grappling uh, with, with that question. And um, there's certainly others who, who um, were forward in a kind of post development uh, school of thought have taken you know, this, this further, uh, Escobar uh, and, and, and Ferguson uh, in particular. Great. I think I think <clears throat> again, sort of, you know, um, those threads that that were visible in uh, part of development, as you said, are sort of, you know, have been taken forward, and we are reading that on this course. And uh, but I think that uh, the issue about not just what is development, but how we speak development that underpins not only our understanding of development, but also the policy frameworks that emerge from that is really something that your book uh, focused on. Uh, so now, um, very briefly, because um, I know you are busy, uh, I want to also ask you a little bit uh, about your new work on food security, if I may. And so the question I was thinking about was what does the idea of development as you have 
um, sort of um, put, sort of uh, sketched out for us does for this sort of issue of food security of people in the global south and why is it important to understand the impact of rapid urbanization that comes with development and is seen to be really one of the indicators of development um, sort of, you know, uh, in, in, in the context of food security. Yeah, OK, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, for that question. Um, yes, I mean, my, my work on food security um, probably began about uh, 2010. Right. Uh, and um, it wasn't something I'd necessarily thought about much before that. Uh, and therefore, there was a catch up process to do. In other words, it starts in 2010. It's not a new concept. It's been around. It's been part of the development landscape and, and discourse for, for for quite a while. So it was important to sort of read back and and, and look at how development uh, was, was treating uh, food security in particular. Um, so I mean the the question. As I, as I sort of interpret it, is, is what is what does um, uh, what does this idea of development do for uh, food security uh, in, uh, in the global south? And I suppose my gut reaction to to what the idea of development does for food security of actual people in the global south is, is probably to say not very much, uh, or at least not very much for many of the uh, food uh, food insecure um, if you look at if you look at how and this is what we did we looked at a lot of texts uh, back in 2010 and we, we visited things that have been talked about since since 2010 about 2019 about the way in which food insecurity is thought about and written about um, you know, looking, for example, at yeah, both the Millennium Development Goals, Sustainable Development Goals, the texts of the uh, United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, uh, IFAD. Um, and there seemed to me to be a core uh, wisdom, let's call it a kind of accepted wisdom, that food insecurity was, is uh, primarily a product of insufficient food production by rural uh, populations uh, in Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, especially in Africa. And that smallholders, small farmers are the key to resolving food insecurity uh, by producing uh, more, producing more, becoming more productive. So, the solution is to is to invest in them to overcome all of this disorder and dysfunction of small farming in the countryside. Uh, land reform, technical expertise, uh, new technologies, new seed types, new fertilizers, new markets, and, and the countryside will be uh, transformed and food security uh, will be achieved. Um, and this kind of idea really, um, you know, I'd certainly invite the students to, to, to look at uh, the sustainable development agenda, and particularly at uh, SDG uh, 2, because it, it which is um, the food security uh, SDG, uh, as you know. Um, and the way in which it constructs uh, food security and the solutions to food insecurity um, are very consistent with this idea that food insecurity is a rural issue and needs to be resolved through smallholder uh, production. Um, I just pulled up actually um, from the uh, uh, SDG website. Uh, What's typical, I mean, it's a typical way of constructing the argument. They start by telling you how many people are hungry, 
um, tell you where they're found in Asia and Africa. Um, tells you what's going to happen if the current trends continue. Uh, tells you how many children uh, are affected by hunger and uh, wasting undernutrition. Um, and then sets up this, this goal that by 2030, hunger will be ended uh, and all people will have access uh, to uh, safe, nutritious, and sufficient food uh, all year round. Okay, so that's that's. There's the problem as it's set up. Here is the uh, solution or the goal is to, is, to, is to end the problem. How do you end the problem? That you then look at the targets that are proposed, uh, and they're all about what I've been saying, which is smallholder farming. Uh, for example, uh, double agricultural productivity and incomes of small scale food producers. Um, including through secure and equal access to land, other productive resources, inputs, knowledge, financial services, markets, uh, etc. Um, implement resilient agricultural practices that increase productivity and production um, is, uh, is another target. That's number four. Uh, another one, increase investment, including through enhanced international cooperation in rural infrastructure, agricultural research and extension services, technology development, and plant, and livestock gene banks in order to enhance agricultural productive capacity. There's nothing new here except for the reference to gene banks. Right? This, this is a kind of a recipe which you can trace back into really deep into the colonial period and, and all this talk about rural development, as it was called then. Now that term is not used anymore, but that's essentially what this is a recipe for. Um, and it's rural development through interventions from the outside. Um, so, what um, I, I think, you know, having made that that, that critique, um, the question is, how do we then approach this very real world problem um, as researchers? Uh, and I think there's a couple of things. I mean, one is really to contest this, this dominant idea uh, that food insecurity is simply a rural production uh, issue. Um, because what's happening is that this kind of dominant uh, approach is silencing the experience of increasingly large number of people. Uh, as we know, the world is 50% or more now urbanized, and most of the projected uh, 2 billion uh, increase by 2050 people live in, in cities uh, and most of those cities are in the global south. So um, through uh, AFSA, that you've mentioned, the African Food Security Urban Network, and then more recently another network which is more global called the 100 Cities uh, Partnership, um, that is what we, we're focusing on, uh, is to try and gather evidence about what's actually happening in urban spaces. Um, so, you know, really, instead of making assumptions about what food insecurity means in the urban context and immediately proposing interventions to tame disorder, we want to understand what it means and how it's experienced and what remedies people themselves uh, want to see. But, uh, what I've noticed in, in, in recent years, uh, I mean very recent years, is that this development industry, uh, I suppose UN Habitat is probably the most obvious uh, place to start, uh, it's begun to see urban food insecurity as a new uh, challenge uh, that can be overcome with the same kinds of technical uh, interventions. So, I mean, I would certainly encourage your students to look at the, uh, at the new urban agenda uh, through this lens. And it's, it's focused on boosting urban agriculture and local uh, food production. I can't actually hear you, Shirin. 
sorry, I think I muted myself and then. <laughs> um, no, I was just wanting to think about uh, the relationship between food insecurity and rethinking development. And I think what you are suggesting is that the kind of similarities between rural and urban focused uh, policy frameworks on on food security don't allow us to do that right to um so i suppose that is my take home point from from what you have just um outlined for us um so thank you so much for uh, taking this time um and and um talking to my students and um yeah Thank you. And I've, I've actually personally, you know, because of your biography and because of your uh, latest work, I've learned a lot. So thanks very much. Well, look, that's a pleasure. It's been, uh, it's been great. Um, I hope students get something out of it. I'd be happy to follow up with any of them if they have uh, questions. And certainly I've, you know, I've made reference to a number of other publications as well. So um, you know, if you want copies of those, for example, that debate, in progress in the geography, they might find that uh, of interest as well. So thanks Absolutely. very much. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> That's really great.